Good afternoon, everyone. This is the uh, continuing um, series of uh, budget hearings, and we'll be hearing this afternoon from the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board, as well as Meet Minneapolis and the Convention Center. But we'll begin today uh, with uh, the Park Board. As we begin, I'm, I'm John Quincy, the chair of the committee, joined by Council Vice President Glidden. Other council members will be joining and uh, exiting throughout the uh, afternoon, so please don't uh, worry about any interruptions for that. Absolutely. Uh, we can begin at, at your uh, pleasure. So we're joined by Superintendent Jane Miller at the Minneapolis Park Board. Great. Welcome. Thank you, Council Member um, Quincy and Glidden. Appreciate being here. You have uh, some handouts that we've provided to you. One is a park funding pack sheet uh, where it uh, documents how we are funding uh, obviously our three major categories maintenance capital and recreation across the city uh, by per, per capita spending we also while our budget book has a uh, the the capital improvements plan in it we've also provided you a larger document demonstrating uh, changes since last year um, provides a, a bit more detail for you and then also um, we are, I am required annually to provide a report to this body as well as our board on the MPP 20 program and spending. And so you've got that as well. So uh, I'm not gonna go through those, but I'm happy either today or at any other point to answer any questions you may have regarding those. So let me just walk you through uh, overall, our budget is built on a 4.1% property tax levy increase, which includes a 4.2% increase for the general fund and a 1.2% increase for the tree levy, which is in its fifth year, 2018 will be the fifth year of an eight year program. Um, also, it includes the um, funding for based on the minimum wage ordinance that council passed earlier this year. Uh, our, board, our budget every year is supported by, supports the comprehensive plan that was adopted by the board that goes through 2020. Obviously, NPP 20, the funding agreement we have with the city, um, and uh, we also have, over the last three years, incorporated racial equity toolkits in building our budget. So our entire capital improvements budget um, is based on data-driven uh, criteria addressing racial and economic equity. In fact, we are the only park system in the country whose entire capital improvement program is based on racial and economic equity. Our also a re recreation center allocation for our part-time staffing, which is the bulk of that budget, is also based on racial and economic equity a criteria that we've established. And then any additions or subtractions to our budget for the upcoming year, we also apply a racial equity toolkit to that as well to ensure that we are not um, increasing racial inequities and in cases that we can enhance racial equity, we're doing that as well. I, um, the, I'm going to highlight by division the major changes that you're going to see reflected in the 2018 budget. I'm not gonna go through every detail but the big changes uh, that you will notice. Um, one of them, for example, is we are adding uh, real-time captioning and text transcriptions to all of our board meetings, uh, funding for that. Um, we are also uh, adding, recommending adding a full-time archivist. We have been archiving all of the historic documents for the park board for the last three years. Um, we thought that it would be something we could go with part-time staffing a few, few years, but have found that actually we have continued more documentation, so we're requesting a full-time archivist. One of the other things that we are adding, our demands for our police services uh, during the summer hours are incredible because of the amount of event, special events we do. In fact, our officers are, have very, very limited vacation time they can take, and often we restrict it because of the demands on our system. We were able to negotiate with the Federation for the addition of part-time officers uh, to augment our uh, officers during our peak hours for events that we have in the season so that we can do a better job of meeting the demands in our system. No. Within the deputy superintendent's office, um, we uh, one change we're gonna be making is uh, putting in funds to operate the Stevens House at Minnehaha Park. Uh, there's been a nonprofit that's been doing that and they no longer have the capacity to do that. So we are uh, gonna be taking that over starting next year. Uh, we are also enhancing some more uh, healthy benefit options for our employees through our HR department. In environmental stewardship, one of the challenges, and I know Council Member Johnson often asks this question, and that is taking care of our regional system. 
Uh, the funding that we are supposed to get from the state is always less than what we're supposed to, and it's been a challenge for us. So we've been able to provide additional fundings to enhance the maintenance in our regional parks. Um, we are also finishing up uh, completion of a natural resources uh, management plan, and so we are uh, requesting a position to actually be funded to help manage the, uh, our natural areas management plan better than we have been able to in the past. Within Recreation Division, um, Phillips Pool will be open in 2018. Um, and given the um, number of staff that we need there to manage that pool, as well as all of the other aquatic facilities we have, we are recommending that we convert some of our part-time lifeguards to full-time staff that will have a much higher level of professionalism, both at Phillips, but also in some of the other pools that we are, have been having challenges in the last several years. Uh, so that will be good. Also, I mentioned earlier in our rec centers and programs, uh, we are using a complete data-driven uh, criteria-based system to allocate funding across our rec centers based on population, needs of the community. Um, there's a variety of criteria that's articulated in the budget. And then in youth development, the area that we have seen the biggest growth in is street reach and pop-up parks and teen teamworks. And so uh, we have, uh, the numbers have exploded over the last five years. And so we are requesting the addition of a, an additional youth engagement position to help manage all the activities that's going on in that area. Um, we are also um, going through a process of uh, trying to make investments in our operations facilities. We've actually been working with Mark Ruff on that to see if there's opportunities for us to collaborate with the city. Um, and that, that's been a great partnership. We also recognize that we don't have enough funds to fund uh, what we need in our operations facilities. We have been setting aside about $230,000 a year for the past four years, and I'm requesting that we increase that to $500,000 a year so that we have fund reserves to do that as well. And to finish, uh, also land acquisition along the river for a River First project, I'm requesting that we continue uh, setting aside $400,000 in our land acquisition fund to continue acquiring property along the river. Obviously, the, the levy for the trees is uh, continuing, and 2018 is year five of our eight-year plan to deal with emerald ash borer and tree loss due to storms for replanting of trees. Um, our enterprise fund has been, uh, we have worked really hard over the last five or six years to stabilize that. We are in the process of negotiating an agreement with the walker uh, for the sculpture garden and we are confident with changes that we're putting in place that that can uh, be self-supporting. When the Guthrie moved from uh, that area to downtown, our funding revenue from parking uh, really uh, made it challenging for us to continue to operate that self-supportingly. But I, with the changes going on, we're confident we can do that. Um, we are also uh, going to be making, we're going to make it, we're actually making a recommendation to the board that uh, at Theater Worth Park, the additional parking lot that's going in for the Adventure Welcome Center, that we have that be a K parking lot. Uh, we will not charge golfers, it will be part of their fee, um, but we're concerned that the demand in that parking lot will be significant, that we need to uh, have that be a pay lot to get turnover in that lot. Um, in our internal service funds, um, again, just continuing to stabilize our both of our funds, setting rate models that are effective um, and both of them, we've both been on plans for both our IT and our equipment services to stabilize those. And we are in year uh, four of a five-year plan in 2018, and we are at 87% of our fleet is now within its lifespan. And when we started this, it was only 43% of our fleet was in its lifespan. Um, and then, as I mentioned, for our CIP, our entire capital improvements plan is based on uh, a criteria-based data-driven system for allocating funds across the park system, both for the regional and the neighborhood park system. Excuse me, Superintendent. Yes. I was wondering if you could just repeat what you said about the fleet. I missed so that. our fleet, um, we are 20, we developed a five-year plan to both stabilize our fleet from a, a reserve a fund to have capital reserves to replace our equipment, but also to have a rate model that allows us to fund the replay, uh, annual, have our annual expenses. And so we'll, we're in year four right now, 2019 will be year five of that plan. It's a five-year plan. When we started that, only 43% of our fleet was in its life cycle, meaning that 
57% uh, of our fleet was beyond uh, the life cycle of the equipment. Okay. And today we're at 87% of our fleet is now within its lifespan so that by the end of 2018, we will have the fund fully funded and all of our equipment will be within their, their lifespan. Thank you. You're welcome. So with that, I'm going to turn over to Julie and she will walk you through uh, the budget book. Good afternoon, council members. Uh, the budget book was provided to you and I'm just going to quickly walk you through the different sections of the budget book. All of the budget documents, including the budget book and all the materials that you have um, been given today and other materials that we provided to the board are available on the park board website. So the first section of the budget book is the budget message. This is uh, the information that Jane, uh, the superintendent, just provided to you. So if there's uh, more detail that you're interested in, that's the section of the budget book that you would uh, go to. The next section of the budget book is our strategic direction, and that is set by uh, our current board and goes through the 20, 2018. The next section is the budget information, our background information, including the service areas, our organization chart, and some fund descriptions. Then we get into the financial sections of the budget book for property taxes and local government aid. Our property tax levy um, for the superintendent's recommended budget is $62.2 million. Uh, that is consistent with what the mayor proposed as well as what the Board of Estimate and Taxation set as our maximum. The park board is 18.3% of the overall city of Minneapolis tax. For local government aid, the park board expects to see just a small increase of about $150,000 in local government aid for a total of $9.3 million. The next section of our budget book is the general fund. Our revenue by major sources, uh, we have a balanced budget at $80.7 million. You'll see that property taxes make up 74% of our general fund budget, so we are heavily reliant on property taxes with fees and other revenues being 14.3% and local government aid 11.6%. On the expenditure side, again, we are heavily reliant on, um, on our personnel with 69% of our budget being personnel driven and um, operating costs as 27%. Expenditures by division. You can see environmental stewardship makes up 50% of our budget. So that's asset management, forestry, environmental management. Recreation services is 24%. So just those two divisions is, is um, just under 75% of our um, operational budget. Our next section of the budget book is special revenue funds. So this is where the tree preservation and forestation fund is housed um, for the the tree levy for um, emerald ash borer and tree loss due to storms, as well as our park grant dedicated revenue fund, as well as the park dedication fees are in, are in this fund. The next section of our budget book is the enterprise division. And our major operating units in the enterprise fund, you'll see customer service with parking use and events permit and vendor concessions are the uh, largest income producers of this fund at this point. Uh, the sculpture garden is in here for the first year of full operations as a conservative estimate. And then the rec recreation division. Uh, golf operations is still reflecting a loss and in 2018 the finance department and recreation division will be working on uh, producing a five-year operating financial plan to um, address uh, this concern that we have with the golf operations. In the enterprise fund, uh, it's supposed to be a self-supporting fund. So we try to add to our reserves annually, uh, which is the net income from the operations. In 2017, we budgeted uh, just under a million dollars being set aside. In 2018, we're recommending 780,000. If you look at the estimated annual set asides, we really should be setting aside close to $3 million a year or a little over $3 million a year in order to fully 
fund the replacement of the assets that we have in that fund. So the superintendent and I have worked really hard over the years, um, over the past years, um, addressing this concern. And we hope that that once we uh, work with golf, we'll be getting, we'll be moving towards um, increasing that annual set aside. The next section of the budget book is the internal service funds. We have three internal service funds, our information technology services, our self-insurance fund, and then the equipment, mobile equipment fleet operations. And those are all balanced um, except for equipment where we're recommending that we use $125,000 of fund reserves uh, to purchase a Zamboni for our parade ice gardens and then to include that going forward in the mobile equipment fleet. Our capital projects fund, you have the detail of all the capital projects that for our CIP program uh, to 2018 to 2023. Uh, this just highlights our the 10.5 million of bonds that's recommended in the mayor's budget book for the MPP 20, as well as our capital levy investment in neighborhood parks. So our total neighborhood park funding for 2018 is recommended at $14.3 million. You'll see that we're recommending using park dedication of $1.1 million in 2018. And then on the regional park side, we have 6.3 million in funding for the regional parks. Julie, excuse me, quick question. I'm looking at the park dedication allocation. Mm -hmm. uh, zero's out in 2020 and it's significantly short in 2019. Can you explain what that reflects? Sure, Councilman um, Quincy. The park dedication dollars really get allocated when we're doing the current year. So even though they're reflecting zero in the out years, we mm -hmm. would be expecting that there will be allocations because as we, sure. as um, park dedications um, money is continually coming in. So as we get closer to the year that we're gonna actually do the project, then we look at the park dedication funding and what availability there is, right. and we make that adjustment. Yeah, I, I presume that was the case. There was always gonna be a, a park dedication fee and how that would be allocated. I just, you know, it looks strange when you look mm -hmm. at it this way. I just wanna make sure that was clarified. Yes. Somebody else have a question? Council President Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Looking at this, um, Regional park funding. Um, the why the discrepancy? You know, it looks like on the top line here, 1.6 million in 2018, and then up to 5.1, and then zero the next year. What? What? What's that all about? Yep, Council Pre President Johnson. On the Metropolitan Council our uh, um, Council funding, it really is um, funded on a biennium. Two year cycle, okay. And in 2018, it was an odd year, but they did bond oh. in 2018. Oh, so okay. that's why you see an amount in 2018. Okay. Great, thank you. Okay. The next section of our budget book is our personnel summary. Uh, and I'll just highlight here that uh, the MPRB workforce history has 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 um, suffered some downturn, uh, and then as of 2012, we have started to um, build the full-time workforce. And of course, the biggest increase was between 2016 and 2017, and that was directly related to the NPP 20 funding. And then in this current budget, the superintendent is recommending 11 uh, new full-time positions. So, um, that as our, the, go ahead. We just have to focus on the picture yeah, for just a moment. Picture. Yeah, isn't that cute? <laughs> Julie does the best job every year of picking great pictures. <laughs> go so, ahead, top that, Jane. Uh, with our recreation centers, as I mentioned earlier on, we have established a, a funding criteria based on racial and economic equity. And we have three tiers of recreation centers, some that are open 28 hours a week, some that are open 37 and a half, and others that are open 42. And so we took our smallest centers and said, okay, what's the baseline funding that every rec center needs? 
uh, to be open for those number of hours and, and every sex rec center was allocated baseline funding. We then, um, and our total budget for part-time staffing is just over 3 million. And so our baseline funding that every center will get will be just over $28,000. We then took the remaining amount, which is 57% of that total, and established, developed uh, community characteristics um, and site-specific characteristics to determine equally the distribution of those remaining funds between those two areas. And, um, and then each center will get allocated uh, their funds. These are the specific criteria that we're looking at. Um, so we took the city's average, for example, for diversity, across the city and if a neighborhood has a higher level of diversity then they will get a point for that um, and health indicators if they are below the city average for health indicators they will get a point snap is the free lunch program through schools um, if they have a higher percentage of people in that community that are part of the snap program they'll get an extra point and so on uh, one of the things I do want to point out with the diversity index and, and uh, Council Member Wasami, I use your neighborhood as a perfect example. Um, we are looking at the diversity of a neighborhood, not the homogeneity, how hom homogeneous a neighborhood is. So, for example, while Cedar Riverside has a very diverse population, it is predominantly Somali. And so it may not get a point because it, it I don't know if it does or not, but because it's more homogeneous, it's less likely to get a point than say the Phillips neighborhood that has Native American, Somali, Latino, for example. Um, and then the site-specific characteristics are very specific to the program and services that are offered within that particular site. I'll pull a couple out as an example. Our Night Owls program is offered at, our nine, at nine of our rec centers in the urban core, um, intentionally designed to provide uh, evening programs for teens that requires a higher level of staff and, and police support. Um, and so level, given the level of intensity of services there, there's more points there. You might want to see the high use site and what that means is, I'll use Pearl Park as an example. While we have that rec center, we have a park that is very heavily used because of the athletic facilities around that. And so facility parks like that, like Loring Park, where there is a lot of heavy use outside of the center itself, that requires center staff to be outside and doing extra work, those parks also get, those rec centers will get an additional point. And so then there is a whole point structure. What I also said was what makes this one different than the uh, capital allocation is that every rec center will get funding. And I said that we will not reduce any rec centers funding for 2018. What we did is we came up with an additional $220,000 so that any of the rec centers that were overfunded based on this criteria, their funding will stay the same as it was in 2017. Any centers that were underfunded, we actually increase their allocation to give them the additional resources and that's what we use the additional $220,000 for. And then finally, um, you have a copy of our draft MPP 20 report um, and that uh, documents um, what uh, this is the content, so it documents the whole closing the gap process we went through, the ordinances that were approved by both, both City Council and the Park Board, what we did in 2016 and 2017 to get this impl implemented, and then what we have spent in all three categories, maintenance, rehab, and capital for 2017, and what our plans are for those funds for 2018 as well. We will have the final report actually available in the spring because we have to finish out the 2017 fiscal year. Uh, and you, City Council will get copies of the final report as well. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Julie and I ha are happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, not seeing any. Uh, Council President, yeah, good. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, it's just, it's general information. I'm. Uh, Victor Memorial Ice Arena, do you guys still own that? That was school? actually opened by the Minneapolis Public Schools. It, it was never they, owned by us. Never owned by you. Okay, okay, okay. Um, and then if somebody could just get back to me about when the park board took over the um, management and ownership of Ryan Lake, that property. Yes, well, I'll get you, Not we'll get you that information. Today, but just yeah. shoot me an email. Absolutely. Today. Oh, and then one other thing, Council Member Glidden and I have had a little bit of a talk about um, just some of, you know, we, we hear a lot of criticism and, you know, a lot of, so to have really good facts is very helpful about what the park board itself is spending on um, 
you know, uh, particular areas and neighborhoods mm -hmm. and that sort of things. Very, very helpful. Uh, but uh, she pointed out, and I and I think that this is probably um, true, although I, you know, haven't delved too deeply in it. But you know, where we do have, when you when you look at your criteria about making decisions about rec centers, where you have a a, a base of people that produce uh, volunteers, uh, that's, and I think they used to call them site councils or. Um, well, yep. we have neighborhood boards, neighborhood councils. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And you have, and there are more. And there's more participation, more capacity in some neighborhoods um, than others. And so, what what does the park board? How do you, how do you uh, account that for that? How do you factor that? In? Yeah. So um, one of the challenges we're actually that's part of our agreement. We have an MOU with the school board uh -huh. to address some of the, and most of those councils are based on athletic programs. Uh -huh. Sure. And so uh, we are in the process right now, that's part of our MOU, is to address athletic event, uh, services provided both by the school board and the park board and these neighborhood associations and create some consistency. One of the challenges both is some neighborhoods are have very strong neighborhood councils, others don't. Uh -huh. They either don't have the financial capacity or the human resource capacity. And um, one of the challenges is those neighborhood associations also charge variety of fees. Some are really expensive, some are less expensive. And so access to programs is a challenge in some in some neighborhoods. So that's part of, we don't have all of that data right now because they're, it's owned by the neighborhood associations, but that's something we're working through and beginning to meet with those neighborhood associations to come up with a more consistent approach, uh, both in terms of fees and charges, but access to programs um, across the city. Okay. Um, and then I'm just curious, I mean, how do you feel like your relationship with the Police Activities League is? Um, it's not as strong as, as it is here, um, but our, our police department, our police officers have a very good relationship uh, with them. I, I don't know that it's really strong from a programmatic standpoint. Mm. But you're talking about your, your police. Our, our I, I got you. I, I'm just wondering how the relationship between because um, that you know years ago is a little bit of a competitive thing, and yeah. but it, it seems to me that it's working better these days. It is. It is. Okay. We have a very good re working relationship. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Council Vice President. So this is just a a question, you know, because you've talked quite a bit in your presentation about your um, development and use of the equity criteria. And I was just curious, kind of, what your thoughts are for, um, you know, um, evaluating how that in the end, yep. you know, and this may be, you know, kind of a little further out in time, I don't know how you pick sort of a best time to start doing yep. the, the look back or whatever, but kind of two things were, were striking me. One was um, just how do you see how it ends up affecting mm -hmm. your, um, your decision making and comparing that to previous decision making, I guess, to get a little, Sense, yeah. sense of that, and then the other thing is how you continue to evaluate your criteria yep. and whether that criteria, I mean, just your comments about the diversity index were, you know, they were interesting, and, you know, it, to me it kind of says, too, is that something, you know, is that producing the point the in the way that is kind of what you're intending, Absolutely. Or, you know, and, or, anyway, so, and I know there's uh, drawbacks to changing your criteria, too, so I'm sure that's uh, that, you know, that produces its own, you yeah. know, challenges. But I just ask because, of course, we are as well right. trying to develop this criteria. I mean, we have some criteria, and I'm sure right. it will be an evolution and, and no, all, all that. No, all very good questions, Council Member Glidden. <laughs> so, so in terms of looking at our history of how we've been spending, that's uh, why three years ago we started creating this park funding fact sheet. So it looks at, takes, uh, the four major areas of the city, the way we divide the city up into four uh, areas of the city, gives you the population for each of those areas and then the per capita spending by area. Um, and, you know, I'm proud of the fact if you look at this, we have spent predominantly higher in North and South Minneapolis than anywhere else in the city in all three categories, maintenance, recreation program, and, and capital investments. Um, and I, And this is something we'll continue to do. In terms of the criteria that we've established in every single case, we have uh, established that we have to do an annual review mm -hmm. of that criteria for a number of reasons. One is, are there unintended consequences we hadn't anticipated? Also, are there changes happening 
that are impacting the scores that a neighborhood or a rec center or a park may get. And in fact, uh, the neighborhood uh, park criteria that we used, 2017 was the first year that we did it. So we actually were able to evaluate it and parks changed in their scoring. Um, in fact, if you look at the CIP information we provided, we actually have the scoring. Is it attached here, Julie? So we have the scoring criteria for the neighborhood parks, and you'll see where each park changed its score. It's color-coded. Anything in green, their score actually went up in that category, and anything that's in orange, the score for that park for that category went down. And so what it's doing is demonstrating are there neighborhood changes based on population, other things in terms of conditions in parks, so that every year we will new, use this no, new scoring because of the changes that have happened. Um, so that's happening, that we will continue to do that with each of those. The other thing that we've done is we have not developed these um, criteria in isolation. We've done them with our partners at Voices for Racial Justice, um, We've also done it with Hope Community. People who do this work for a living, we've done it with GARE, Government Alliance on Race and Equity, it's for them to make sure they give us their feedback so that we're, we aren't doing this in isolation, which has been really critical for us. The other thing that I will say is we have been in conversations with the University of Minnesota, and I actually got a call from, I had conversations with people from the University of Pennsylvania um, who are very interested in looking at us doing a long-term 20-year longitudinal study. Yeah to see if the impacts of what we are doing and spending are making changes in the neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, the other critical thing that we're also looking at is gentrification. Um, so that, you know, what's critical for us is that we're not displacing people. Um, and so we're going through that process all right, uh, as well right now and having conversations around impacts of gentrification. And to be very honest with you, I think that part of the conversation is both the long-term 20-year study, we're talking to them both about the parks and street funding um, because they're using racial and economic criteria. But where I also believe the gentrification conversation, while we're gonna start the conversations around parks, I think it's gonna be a critical conversation us to engage the city in that because <coughs> of the, the role that you play much broader than we do, whether it's affordable housing support or other things uh, to allow people to stay in place. So um, just a couple of comments that I wanted to, to make to follow up on that. And, and by the way, I just think what you're doing is, is very cutting edge work. I mean, really it is. And uh, you're, I think, to be congratulated for being thoughtful and definitely going through the ups and downs of what does it mean to, to try to reevaluate good, solid processes that you feel like you can have faith and trust in, but also you can be transparent with the community. Right. And, you know, I mean, that's really tough work. Um, I, uh, what, so um, I helped uh, host a meeting recently with a bunch of city staff uh, with the Mapping Prejudice uh, Project. And so I don't know if uh, at the park board you have had an opportunity to, to meet with them yet. I think CPED uh, will end up having a more formal partnership okay. um, uh, with the Mapping Prejudice Project. But uh, if you don't know what it is, it's a project from Augsburg University yes. where they are doing the, the, the tracking of historical deeds that have uh, racial covenants yep. in them. And so in their presentation, one of the early findings, and they're not through the city yet, but was about how those racial covenants were used, not necessarily even where um, African Americans were starting to move, but where uh, white residents felt this was a new planning tool, mm -hmm. and uh, they started to utilize it. It was very, very interesting to me. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, and that many of the areas where these racial covenants are clustered, at least in the early analysis, is by a couple of our lakes in particular in South Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. Again, that this is yep. showing that kind of all right around those lakes, yep. you are seeing racial covenants that prohibited yep. African Americans and probably uh, uh, Jewish did. individuals mm -hmm. as well and, and others from living in those prime uh, location. So I right. just think it seemed, I'm sure there's going to be many, many lessons for the city, yeah. but I Absolutely. just, it was one lesson that I thought was very interesting that relates to our park system, and particularly our park system in South Minneapolis, yep. 
-hmm. south and south, southeast mm -hmm. and southwest Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. And um, so you, that might be some, an interesting mm -hmm. uh, to, to see if there may be some more formal connections that you can establish uh, with them as they continue to work on their, their research. And yeah. again, I think the city will be doing that as well. Then the other thing I just wanted to say is that um, I, I did have an opportunity to meet with some of your staff mm -hmm. that was in, I don't know what you call it, but kind of your our cohort, our your, racial equity cohort, your racial yeah. equity cohort that uh, Jennifer Ringold helps uh, lead. And I just want to say it was really impressive, kind of the deep work and very thoughtful work that you were doing. And they were very generous to offer to meet with our city staff to share some of their lessons. So I just want to say thank you for that. I thought that was very generous of them with their time and and I'm sure we have things that we can learn from you. Well, thank you. No, I'm I'm really proud of the work that we've been doing and it's uh, uh, just on a personal note, and I think for the organization, it's been very disheartening the things that people have been saying when we are really doing cutting edge work. Uh, I get calls all over the country because of the work that we're doing on racial equity um, because we are leading the nation in the work that we're doing within the park system. It's pretty impressive um, and I'm really proud of that. And um, you know, I, to your point about the covenants on land, I think uh, to that point, I think it's even more critical the work that we're doing along the river to provide the kind of destination parks for residents of North and Northeast Minneapolis that they don't have that people in South and South Minneapolis do, um, that I would be surprised would have covenants on them, but because it was the industrial core of the city to provide the kind of uh, really amazing park system and park destinations along the river uh, to residents of North and Northeast Minneapolis is, in my view, really critical. Good. Well, thank you very much, thank Superintendent. You. Appreciate the uh, uh, presentation and the detail. And as uh, Council Vice President said, the cutting Thanks edge work that's being happening. So thank, thank you, thank you very much. much. We can uh, move now to the uh, the next uh, segment and the final segment of our budget hearing schedule. We'll be joined by. Uh, representatives from the Meet Minneapolis team as well as our convention center uh, staff. We'll just allow for whatever time you guys need as transition, so whenever you're ready, let me know. It's not. Mr. Johnson, welcome. Whenever you're ready, you can Thank begin. You. This is the Convention Center and Downtown Assets, incredible important part. So we look forward to it. Great. Thank you, uh, Chair Quincy and Council Members. Uh, good to see you all. Uh, my name again, Jeff Johnson. I'm the Executive Director of the Minneapolis Convention Center. I just want to let you know that uh, this uh, Minneapolis Convention Center and Downtown Assets Plan and Budget is located on Budget Book pages E8 to E21. Uh, there will be some discrepancies in some of the um, spreadsheets. Uh, there have been some updates, and so the things that we're showing on the screen are actually the most up-to-date. So if you do see some things that are different, uh, the screen will always uh, put you in the right place. I wanted to take a second just to uh, introduce a couple people that are in the group, in the crowd here. Um, Mark Zerbel, our Director of Event Services uh, from the Convention Center. And although not a city employee, we take her on as our own, but Katie Smith, who's our Director of um, Sales and Marketing, works for Meet Minneapolis, but at the Convention Center. And then Chris Hungis, our Director of Business Administration, and really want to call out Chris because she puts together 
this presentation and the budget and does all of the hard work uh, for us. So thank you to all of them. And then Melvin Tennant with Meet Minneapolis will be presenting um, after I'm done and, and talking about Meet Minneapolis and their supplemental budget requests. Very good. All right, well, let's get started. Uh, the big news this year for our budget is the proposed transition to the downtown assets plan. Uh, the city council through the Ways and Means Committee gave a staff direction to the city coordinator to look at a coordinated response to large public assets downtown with a corresponding five-year budget to address operating and capital needs of those assets. Out of this staff direction and the mayor's rec recommendation of the budget uh, grew the downtown assets plan, which is a title that encompasses uh, not only a committee, but also a budget and infrastructure assets. The downtown assets committee is chaired by the city coordinator and includes the city's chief financial officer, public works director, community planning and economic development director, and the executive director of the Minneapolis Convention Center, myself. This committee is tasked uh, with developing uh, the plan for overseeing the implementation of the downtown assets plan. Actual implement implementation of this plan has been delegated operationally to um, the convention center staff and me as the executive director of the convention center. Downtown assets is also a budget, which we will get into. Um, the convention center's budget is really transition, transitioned to contain more elements or programs uh, that will help address several financial outcomes. First, the downtown assets budget seeks to act as a buffer to the general fund by guaranteeing funds uh, from the hospitality sales and entertainment taxes to be available via transfer each year. In 2018, uh, the mayor's proposal is that that transfer be just over $30 million. This guarantee buffers the general fund from economic downturns that could affect the hospitality taxes and thus the general fund. It also allows for consistency in forecasting the five-year financial direction for the city. The downtown assets budget also pools resources to fund assets that from time to time need fluctuating operating or cap capital infusions. The general fund is isolated from non-catastrophic yearly needs of these downtown assets. The downtown assets committee will be able to plan for increases or de decreases in the financial needs of these assets and spread the resources to the areas of needs. Hospitality sales and entertainment taxes are directed toward a broader uh, set of assets than they were in the past. Uh, this allows infrastructure um, that helps drive hospitality and sales taxes to use this money in order to continue to grow that tax fund and that tax base. Downtown Assets sets a long-term finance plan of at least five years to coincide with the city's five-year financial direction. And the downtown assets really helps weather the volatility of the hospitality sales and entertainment taxes through fund balances and through the management of these combined resource needs. Lastly, the downtown assets are also things or infrastructure. And these assets are currently the Minneapolis Convention Center, Target Center, Commons Park, and PV Plaza. We will be able to more efficiently manage these assets through single operational oversight by myself and my staff with the help of the uh, and oversight of the downtown assets committee. Keeping these individual assets thriving will also, while also man managing the different individual needs of the assets is a difficult task. We will be using resources that were once just dedicated to making the convention center the economic engine that it is today and transitioning those resources to using the funds more broadly to be shared by others, which will no doubt take good planning and oversight. There are some really substantial obligations that are now tied to the hospitality sales and entertainment taxes. And as a city, we need to make sure that we are continuing our great work with attracting tourists, visitors, convention attendees, and other entertainment seeking guests. Growth in the hospitality and sales and entertainment taxes ensures that these assets will be well taken care of and that the general fund is not affected. The downtown assets plan will allow certain efficiencies and good planning will be used to adjust our plans as needed to overcome economic challenges. Although this plan might be more difficult for those involved, including myself, um, 
As a whole, the Downtown Assets Committee believes it is a better and more um, efficient and planful way to use our city's resources. So with that said, I wanted to jump into kind of the details of it. So the first slide here, uh, we show where the sources of funds coming into the Downtown Assets uh, Plan, obviously coming from our local taxes. Those use of funds, and you can see the top line is the uh, guarantee transfer out to the general fund uh, each year. And then the buffer that I talked about at the end is really the fund cash balances that are there uh, to make sure that if we do have a year where the taxes are, are not performing where we think they are, there is a little bit of a savings account that we can use to, to help uh, smooth out um, those uh, and so they're not a catastrophic issue or that we um, don't have the ability to maintain these, these funds. <clears throat> Brings us really then to our budget summary, which we will get into um, based on our programs and our uh, 2018 uh, recommended funding, and then those change items, which we will discuss as we go forward to our programs. Obviously, the convention center uh, is the core, the foundation of our hospitality community in Minneapolis. Our convention center special revenue fund um, is still in play, and we're still watching it. Uh, I guess the biggest thing to note here is at the bottom, the ending cash balance is where um, that is being reduced uh, through um, spreading these uh, resources out to uh, all of the downtown assets. As we get into the programs, uh, our first program is our facilities program. So this is the budget line item that talks about how we take care of our 1.6 million square foot asset, which is the Minneapolis Convention Center. We've been wor working very, very hard over the last few years to make sure that we run our building efficiently and that we reinvest in our building to make sure that we remain competitive and that we have the operations uh, from the facility standpoint that our guests need and want. In 2018, we're asking for a little bit less money than we did in 2017. Um, basically, that is because we have been able to save some um, funding by our efficiency. But also, we are so busy in 2018 that the amount of capital projects that we could possibly do is being lessened um, just because we have a great year coming. Some of those ways that we are uh, being more efficient, uh, we've really looked at three areas that, that our staff has really um, championed going forward. The first is uh, reduction in water usage. So not only does that save us money, uh, it also saves our community and makes sure that the City of Lakes still has great water and uh, that we're not using potable water uh, for things that, that we don't need to use potable water for. So last, uh, in 2016, the summer of 2016, we installed a rainwater catchment system and that rainwater catchment system is used for irrigation for our grounds. Uh, that has saved about 5.4 million gallons of water by using that system. The second area that we've really focused on is our energy usage. And so, um, again, as you can see from the graph, we have done great work in reducing the amount of energy that we use. And uh, that, again, helps our bottom line in, in making sure that our costs are at least not rising in those areas. But it also, again, lessens our carbon footprint. Much of the areas of improvement that uh, have helped us re reduce our energy use have been in LED lighting and then our control system for heating and cooling has been um, upgraded. So a lot of those things have helped us uh, achieve these goals. And then the third area is our recycling percentage. So when we started out uh, in 2009, we were recy recycling at a 32% rate. Now we are consistently at 60% or above. And again, this is a great way for us to operationally uh, make sure that our impact on our community is a positive impact um, and a lot of uh, of the waste and trash that is uh, that comes from the events at our building is now not going to the local landfills. And the world is noticing. And so we have received some certifications uh, that really show that, uh, that we are doing a great job and really prove that we're doing a great job. And the first one is uh, we were the sixth convention center in the world to receive level one certification by the Green Meetings Industry Council. And this certification really goes towards how you operate your building, how you work with your clients and, and guests to make sure that they're doing things as sustainably as possible. And again, their impact on our community is as positive as possible. And then the second one is 
probably more well known, but it is uh, LEED certification for existing buildings. And so in 2017, we were certified as a LEED building, which is uh, no small task for a 28 year old building that wasn't built to those standards. Um, but again, it really shows the dedication from our staff to do the right things and to invest in our building uh, and make sure that we're run as efficiently as possible. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Johnson, I just wanna, if you go back a couple of slides, I'm looking at the uh, gallons of water and the uh, energy usage. Uh, and you said, yeah, obviously we're using less, but a lot of this reflects the investments that were made at the convention center in capital investments that we've made over previous years. I'm talking about like bathrooms, uh, putting water fountains, et cetera, are all gonna be talking about how we changed our water usage, but it required an investment to get the savings. It just didn't happen because you had less traffic in the building. And in fact, you had a lot more traffic in the building. So it's just a, really important to point out, especially when we're talking about the energy um, usage, um, that's when you, you put in the LED lighting, but that required an upfront investment that is starting to pay off that we can see now. I just wanted to highlight that for folks. Sure, Quincy, uh, thank you very much. Yes, and, and some slides in the, in, that I'm going to get to are gonna show how busy we are. And so to be able to save energy and save water usage when we are as busy as we have ever been is a, is a huge um, task. And, and the investments that the city has made in the building um, have really helped us do that, but also the fact that we're not have, now having to spend money on those, those increased energy um, costs is, is really a great savings that we will reap um, every single year. I'm going forward. And when you were talking about the recycling, does that include the compost? When did we introduce the compost correct. So, uh, reclamation? Uh, Chair Quincy, correct. The composting, right now we are able to compost uh, a high percentage of that uh, instead of sending it to the, um, the landfills. So both our food is composted and then all of our concession products are also uh, composted, um, whether that's the 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 cups that we use, the napkins that we use, all of those are compostable. Thank you. Just point, wanted to point out one of the areas that uh, is a little bit out of our control is our um, internal service charges. And so as you look at our, our budget, one of the, the things that, that we did have to fight back against a little bit as far as being able to save as much money as we could was a $500,000 increase in our internal service charges um, for 2018. And so as you look at um, our overall expenses, we can take that into account that that's something that we really didn't have any control of, but has raised our uh, expenses in 2018. Our next program is a very small program, but it is the Talmadge building. Again, that is the building that is uh, across the uh, plaza from the Minneapolis Convention Center. We have been operating it for many years as an office building um, and currently have a few tenants left in the Talmadge building. Uh, for 2018, uh, we're really going status quo with the Talmadge building. Um, really wanted the downtown assets plan to be put in place so that we could look at it in, in a broad view um, when we make decisions. But in 2018, we do have to have some discussions about what to do with that building. There are several um, issues that, that have to be, um, from a capital standpoint, that have to be put into that building. And so as part of the downtown assets plan, we'll come up with uh, where we wanna take the Talmadge building going into the future. Council Vice President Flynn. I just wanted to, um, yeah, that sounds that sounds right, but um, can you just give me a little indication of what, what are the immediate capital issues for the Talmadge building that make uh, decision making in 2018 important? Uh, Chair Quincy, Council Member Glidden, uh, there are several um, large issues that, that one is the foundation is in. Uh, it's a very old building. I don't yeah. know exactly when it was built, but it has a limestone foundation. Mm -hmm. And so that foundation would need significant uh, improvements uh, over time. Also, the building has a beautiful ivy that's growing all over it, but ivy is not very good for um, brick facades. And so there are several areas where that ivy has the, caused the brick facade to come apart. And so, um, we are having some leaking issues and some different types of issues. And so um, it is substantial um, what would have to be done to bring that building to a place where um, we think it should be. And so we have to weigh now all of our resources if the downtown assets uh, goes forward and try to figure out where the best place is to put, put our uh, funding and our resources going forward. And that will be part of the downtown assets committee and, and this plan going forward to try to figure out how to do that. 
I see. Okay. Thank you. And then our next program is our events program. And so this is really how we um, take care of our clients and our customers and our attendees when they come into Minneapolis and they, when they come into the Minneapolis Convention Center. This program really drives economic activity in Minneapolis. And I know this is a budget presentation and so we're all about numbers and spreadsheets, but really when you just start to think about why do we have a convention center, there are a couple points here that I think um, answer that question very, very well for me. And that is that the Minneapolis Convention Center supports over 11,000 jobs in our community. So those are 11,000 hospitality jobs in our community that um, are supported because of the activity that happens at the Minneapolis Convention Center. So it's not just about the numbers in the budget, it's the numbers of people that we have employed and, and actively working in the city. Also, hospitality taxes that are directly affected and attributable to the Convention Center are tw over $26 million that come in just because of the activities of the Convention Center. And then when you talk about economic impact, I know these numbers can be what they are, but uh, we're looking at 2018 as our largest year for economic impact based somewhat on the Super Bowl. Obviously, that is going to bring, bring a lot of people to the Convention Center for Super Bowl experience, but it's not just the Super Bowl. We have a huge year coming forward, a big event, uh, the National Education Association is coming, and so probably our biggest convention that we have had in, in several years. And so 2018 is a year that we will be drawing people from all over the world to Minneapolis, and they will be spending their money and enjoying themselves here. And so um, as we look at the total budget, we can really start to look back at these numbers and say, well, why do we do this? We do this for the jobs, we do this for the taxes that come to the city, and we do this for the economic spending and economic in impact that happens um, here in Minneapolis. We're projecting a record revenue year for the Convention Center in 2018 of just over $20 million. That's a 7% increase over our budgeted 2017 um, uh, revenue numbers. And so, again, a great great year in, in 2018 coming. But Jeff wasn't 2017 a record? Well, we haven't finished out uh, 2017. Um, it looks like it will be. So yeah, we'll, uh, of the last uh, five years, four of those years have been record revenue years. So I just um, wanted to highlight it. I thought it was fun. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's outstanding. Looking at that events program, um, in 2018, we'll be asking for just a little bit more money than we did in 2017, really based on the activity levels and the amount of uh, uh, events that are in the building. This slide really shows again uh, that economic activity, um, economic impact, the amount of people that will be coming from out of town, um, and the amount of people that we will be serving uh, in 2018. And then this uh, showcases that uh, operating revenue as you've so duly noted. Uh, we have had great success increasing our revenues over the last uh, several years. Um, and we've done a good job efficiency-wise, again, keeping our expenses generally um, flat uh, based on um, some of the things that we've been doing. And so we feel really good about the position that we're in. We talk about the subsidy, we own it, because that is something that I think is a great thing to talk about. Because again, as I stated before, when you just look at uh, the spreadsheets, you don't truly understand what the subsidy is. So the subsidy is the difference between our operating revenue and our operating expenses. And we uh, are have an $8 million, we're projecting an $8 million subsidy for 2018. Uh, we have been able to, over the last decade, cut that subsidy in half through our efficiencies. And then I'm gonna tie back again to $8 million subsidy, but 11,000 jobs. $26 million in taxes generated, and over $600 million in economic um, impact. And so for, for me, the way we look at this is really that it is an investment. It's an investment in our community, and that return on the investment is something that we're driving every single day to make sure that that return on the investment for our citizens is, is a great place. And so we look at this because we wanna make sure that we're watching it and, and managing it, um, but we also know that it drives these great investments in our community. 
These next two slides really, again, outline how busy we are going to be. And so event days in 2018 will be our highest ever. Um, and then as we look at occupancy, our occupancy will be extremely high. So 66% occupancy is a very large uh, number. We are one of the busiest convention centers in the country. Most convention centers from an occupancy standpoint are in the 50% range. So we're an active, engaged building in our community. Once we get to about 70% in occupancy, that's where we, we almost can't handle it. Uh, getting people in, moving people out, um, changing over the building becomes extremely difficult. And so 66% um, is a very strong occupancy um, rating and it just shows again how busy we're going to be in 2018. Something obviously that a lot of departments are looking at, a lot of businesses are looking at is uh, our employees and we know that we can't serve our clients and our guests without our employees and we have a fantastic group of employees. Um, as part of becoming more efficient you can see that in 2012 uh, in, we reduced the amount of employees that we have in our building so this kind of goes back again to that discussion about energy. We are as busy as we have ever been but we have less employees than, than we have um, had in the past. And that's okay because we're working smarter, we're working more efficient. But we know that there is a huge retirement bubble coming and a lot of our employees are eligible to retire. And so in order to make sure that we maintain ourselves at the, as the foundation of the hospitality community, we know that we need to go out there and recruit great people with a heart of service to come in and work for us um, at the convention center. And so. I have a short video to show you of how we're promoting ourselves. It'll give you a good view of what our employees look like and what they're saying, but I'm going to put the video now. Working at the Minneapolis Convention Center is fun. It's exciting. We support each other in family. We are all here to give our best and that's why to be the best. It's a team environment. We got a lot of good people who have been here a long time. Good job. <laughs> we have so many different diversity. You meet all walk of life here. It's all kind of like interdependent. Like I need you, you need me, we are a team. You need to work with each other, you need to rely on each other because one person can't do it alone. I've always felt there's something just a little bit magical about working in the event industry to see all this information that you've put together manifest into a real event and people coming and attending and enjoying it. It's really exciting. At the core of what everybody does here is hospitality. That's really our industry. How's it going? Everything's all good? Good. We're all serving the people who come into the convention center and making them come back is, is a goal. It doesn't matter who, what role you are in. One person can make a difference in this building and in this industry. It is a contribution of individuals that makes impact to the entire building. We like to say that if, if someone's having a bad day or if someone is their first time in Minneapolis, the smile that they see from us can change their day for the rest of the day. If you love something, you do it to the extent, and that's what we do here. We provide great customer service to our clients, to our customer, to our family. We're our family here. It's a good workplace culture. It's a great environment for your future. It's a place to learn. It's a place to grow. Everybody here is working to make a difference, to make our guests happy. Each and every day, we have the opportunity to do something different. Each and every day, we have the opportunity to meet different people, and if you love people, uh, this is a great place to work. Join us to make an impact. So great representation of our staff. I think, you know, we take it very seriously that we are the face of Minneapolis. Uh, we're the first people that people see when they come to Minneapolis and we represent Minneapolis. And so um, that was a great uh, view of uh, that representation from our staff. Good. Council Vice President. Just, um... It just uh, seeing your recruiting video just kind of triggered something for me because we, um, you have a lot of employees. Um, it's a great introduction to the city, and I'm just curious: Are you feeling like your employees feel connected to what may be sort of pathways to advancement through the city? I know we're trying just to be 
a lot more thoughtful about that now and for someone to get a great if, if that is their first job with the city i know not that isn't always the case but if it is you know i just uh, i feel like that you know you are a great entry point uh, to mm -hmm. the city and for people to feel like they can continue to grow and advance their career and get a higher salary and get promotions and all of that through the city enterprise um so I just wanted to pose that to you. You don't need to give me a big long answer right now, but um, if that isn't, you know, happening in a really robust way, I think now is a good time to kind of continue to enhance those connections and are there more formal kind of pathways that can be established where some of those connections to um, advancement with, within the city can be made? Chair Quincy, Council Member Glidden. I won't go, I could go a long answer, but I, I would just say yes. And okay. I think that what we have tried, I think hospitality in generally is a, is a fantastic yeah. um, way to get people engaged into a workplace. Um, it takes hard work, it takes love of people, it takes service. Um, and I think that what we have done and, and feel very confident in, in saying this, we have worked hard at trying to increase those pathways, at least inside of the convention center to make sure that um, we are able to grow people through the convention center. And that has been a challenge. It's a challenge when we go out and we look, especially for leadership level positions um, in making sure that um, we encompass what Minneapolis looks like and, and in those communities that Minneapolis serves. And we've had some really great successes. Doing so that. I would just say it, it'd be interesting to kind of see, and I appreciate that you have been thoughtful about that through the convention center environment, be interesting to see how that looks through the entire city enterprise as you're you're part of that enterprise and also it'd be good to see kind of what does tracking look like you know um, how many times does someone start at the con convention center and then proceed up through the city environment and i just say this too because i know that enterprise-wide i'm not talking about your um, uh, workplace but enterprise-wide retention is a significant issue at the city and so again, kind of seeing, does someone start and they feel excited and fulfilled? You know, that's a great start. And then, you know, how they proceed, whether it's through the convention center or through the broader city enterprise. You know, council president. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to be engaged in that. Yeah. People usually don't want to leave the convention center. Yeah. It's a pretty yeah, great place be, to work, right. but yes, yeah. um, mm -hmm. I'd love to be involved in that conversation. Great, council president Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and, and um, council member Glidden. I think the converse of that too, uh, that, that people in the city enterprise in general realize what opportunities there are at the convention center. Yeah. I and mean, we have 40, sure. what, was, what was the number of people that are eligible for retirement? 40 something? Yeah, 45, I can't even remember, 47. But I mean, I, you know, this became kind of clear to me when we had um, the, the real economic downturn and we had um, a number of layoffs across our enterprise. And, and it seemed to me that we as a city handled that better than a lot of cities because we had places for people to go, because we have this very diverse business uh, business lines that some cities don't, ha don't have, you know, our parking system, our convention system, convention center. And so I, I just think we, the ties could be, could be closer, uh, both uh, you to us and, and I mean, you're us, but, but you know what I mean? You're just, you're a little bit remote and, I don't know that people always think about, you know, if they're ready to move on to the next level and they're in the involved in the city enterprise here, that there are opportunities there too. Great. Move on to our next program. Uh, this is a program uh, added for uh, the NCAA uh, Final Four. It's $100,000 in one-time money that would be used uh, to support uh, city services and permits for that 2019 NCAA Final Four. Um, the Final Four is our next big event after the um, the Super Bowl. Yeah, yeah that's it. Yeah. Uh, and it really bringing in $54 million in economic impact. So another great event uh, coming to Minneapolis. Moving on now to the Target Center and just showing first the Arena uh, Special Revenue Fund. Um, won't go through that, but Target Center program has been with the Convention Center for several years. Um, obviously, the big news here is that the Target Center is newly renovated and um, ready to provide a great impact uh, to the city. About $100 million in, in estimated economic impact every year comes from the Target Center and great events. 
Uh, we know that uh, $2.7 million from taxes and rents directly comes um, from our relationship. Uh, we know that we're excited about uh, how the new Target Center will bring in more revenue, uh, more events uh, to the city. Uh, this is the first year, though, that we are operating in the new Target Center, and so we're being a little bit more conservative. We have some new terms to our operating agreement with AEG, um, but a little montage here of some of the great pictures. I think um, we can all be very, very proud of the Target Center and the investments and the decisions that the city made in reinvesting in this building that is so perfectly placed in our city, but now is um, operating in a way that will draw great events, will provide amenities for uh, people that uh, they see in other arenas, and, and now they're able to, to have them in Minneapolis at the Target Center, and also fits better into our neighborhood and our community, um, both from a walking standpoint. Now you can enter the building in different ways. You can walk around the building in different ways, um, but also from an aesthetics um, in how it affects uh, our downtown area. So we're all very, very excited. I can tell you the first few events in October and, and a couple events that we've had in November have performed very well financially, uh, even better than, than they were performing in, in the old um, Target Center. Operationally, our events are getting in quicker and out faster with our new loading dock and, and marshalling yard. Um, and the reviews that we have heard have been um, awesome, I, I think uh, better than we could even have ever imagined uh, coming into this, that people really do see that this was a transformational investment, and we did it all for a fraction of the cost that other communities are putting into brand new facilities in a very much more sustainable way of keeping a facility instead of tearing it down. Mr. Johnson, I, I know you're about to get into the program as it relates to the 18 budget, but I have to say, uh, this Target Center renovation was an amazing project, and you specifically, and the team at the Convention Center, to be a part of that, to make sure that it happened on time and on budget. And you consider the sales taxes that have been generated uh, this past year when Target Center was dark for six months. It's a, it's a phenomenal effort. And uh, we have something that is really gonna be, uh, you said it, transformational, um, and I think it's gonna be uh, remarkable how we've paired that with these downtown assets. This is a city-owned project, Target Center. Convention Center is, but we need to be looking at them as one piece of a, uh, of a, of a spectrum of how we're uh, being able to attract and serve uh, guests from around the world. Um, and I, I know there's a great picture there. Uh, Council Member Gl uh, Gord, uh, excuse me, Goodman, I hope you can say something positive about the convention or Target Center right now as we're involved in that Target Center implementation team and, and Mr. Johnson's role. We're talking to each other, folks. I mean, <clears throat> do we really want to do that? I do. I, I, don't, I, I don't see the reason to do that. No one is here. It makes me sad to see that three departing people are the only ones here to talk about this budget. So there's a whole bunch of people who don't care. Um, and so I'm, I'm frustrated about that as it is, as I'm sure the three of you and Councilmember Bender, who's here, and I are. Jeff, you're awesome. I think you're awesome. But really, actions speak louder than words. And when you don't have people coming to these budget hearings, then anything you say really, anything I could say isn't as meaningful as anything I've said to you directly. <clears throat> and uh, as you know, we've had a very um, growing type relationship over time, and I hold you in very high regard, and that's why I'm here. And that's why these guys are here too. And I think the fact that we don't have a big, big turnout from people who are coming back and people who are elected speaks louder than anything I could say. Mr. Johnson. It was not, sorry about that. <laughs> Council President Johnson. Mr. Chair, thank you. And you know, I'm, I'm gonna share the same thought though of, of everybody that's involved in this uh, industry. I just have to tell a little story. I was gonna wait till Melvin uh, got up, but the other day I was trying to deal, I'm having a, a reconstruction project uh, in my ward, a road reconstruction, 42nd Avenue North. It's awesome, beautiful. But you know, there's always little hiccups, you know, and so I'm out there in the in the street, in the in the mud, really and truly, to, to figure out when they're gonna lay sidewalk, because it's getting cold, you know, and, they, and the construction took longer than they thought. But anyway, I'm in front of this catering company, 
And this catering company has probably been in my ward. It used to be out in Plymouth, and it was too expensive for them to be in Plymouth. And so they moved into uh, North Minneapolis, into my ward, probably four years ago or so. And they've been in this space. And um, what they were telling me is the engineers weren't paying enough attention to them, and they're very concerned because they have $150,000 worth of catering business that is associated with the Super Bowl. And the last time uh, I remember reading about one of their events, it was the Ryder Cup. Uh, so we don't tell the story enough. And, you know, I mean, that's my line. I, a lot of those people that work at the convention center live in my ward. These are great, great jobs for people. And we, you know, City Enterprise, our communications, I, Spencer was here for a while. We need to tell the story better. This is, this is what it means to have uh, this, again, this business that's within our city that is then supporting people's uh, lives, lives uh, buying houses in our, in our city and being able to feed their families. And I, I just don't think we, we tell it often enough. We don't tell it loud enough. Um, but it just it, it hit me home when I, when I talked to these, uh, uh, this catering company. That, that stuff is really important. And, you know, people have done a great job of uh, telling the small businesses how to, how to get into this business, how to how to join, how to make the most of these opportunities that are coming, uh, but we have to tell more more about the impact for the people that live here. Yep. Great. I will uh, keep moving. Uh, Target Center program again, asking for just a little bit less money in 2018 than 2017. Based again, we don't know how the uh, new operation of the the new facility will work, um, but we feel good about. Uh, the initial returns. <clears throat> now getting into the new downtown assets plan and commons program, obviously uh, recommended for $750,000 to go towards the operation of commons. Uh, currently, Green Minneapolis has a contract to do the operations uh, for uh, the commons park. This would be a part of downtown assets. PV Plaza is a uh, Another part now newly entered into the downtown assets plan. Again, PV Plaza is, uh, we're recommending $4.4 million to go towards uh, PV Plaza. That would be up to $4 million to go for the capital improvement uh, that would be uh, supplemented by uh, up to $4 million in fundraising uh, that is uh, happening right now to totally re revitalize uh, PV Plaza, Public Works is really um, building it and in charge of that program. Um, but then afterwards, uh, the Downtown Assets Fund would take over. And then $400,000 for ongoing maintenance and operating costs of, of PV Plaza. So at this point, I will pause uh, if there are any questions, but otherwise I will hand it off to Melvin Tennant. Thank you very much, Mr. Johnson. We do have one from Councilmember Goodman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I had the good fortune of being at the Convention Center last night uh, for a very large event, over 800 people, uh, that was beautifully staffed by the Convention Center staff, not just on uh, the food service, which was amazing as always, uh, but all of the people who were assisting with the check-in and the setup and the management of the entire um, program and this is a group of 800 people that could choose the Hilton uh, or they could choose the Marriott or they could choose to go elsewhere and they have chosen the Convention Center and I can absolutely see why. Um, I was proudly um, referred to by name by some of the staff who were there. I was really surprised by that. I'm lucky to have a lot of constituents who work in food, food service and I can't say enough good things about Kelber. Um, but when we have the opportunity as citizens to attend events at the Convention Center, I for one am someone who show, feels great pride in that. And after being on the council for many, many years, I've seen the ups and downs of management and I think you do a superb job at managing contracts and managing the situation. Often vendors who are unhappy uh, feel that they can reach out to us and I've never had a situation where you have not honestly and quickly resolved a complaint. Uh, by a constituent or a vendor, and I think the operation at the convention center is as good as I have ever seen it from a personal and professional level. Um, but being there last night was just a wonderful reminder. So thank you, Councilmember Glidden. Thanks. I just realized this might be the last time I see you, Jeff. So um, just wanted to say I, I really I, I didn't want to pile on, but I just I really <laughs> echo the comments 
that others have said, and I've 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 seen a change too, and in the time I've been here was which isn't as long as uh, uh, for some of my colleagues, but uh, you've you've done a stellar job, and uh, and we're lucky to have you with the city of Minneapolis. So thank you. Thank you. Well, we can't do anything without support, and so really appreciate <laughs> the support of the city council, and especially all of you. It's been it's been great, and so. As you've said, we are hoping for that support to continue and really wanting to make sure that we are telling our story better and getting out there and, and, and again, showing that uh, we have an incredible impact on our city and a positive impact on our city. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Tennant. Welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Quincy, members of the committee, Melvin Tennant with me at Minneapolis. Thank you for allowing us to be here. Before I get started, I'd like to introduce some of the team members that we have with us today, and I've flipped to the organizational chart so some of the uh, uh, functions will come to life. We have uh, Bill Deef, who is our uh, uh, VP of uh, Public Affairs, Sandy Christensen, a former city executive, our Director of Finance, uh, Vice President of Finance Administration. Brent Forrester is in charge of all things sales. Courtney Reese is in charge of all things marketing and partnership. We have Kevin Hanstead, who is uh, commonly referred to as Big Data. He's our Director of uh, Market Research and Public Affairs. And of course, you met Katie already. She gets introduced twice because she, we, we share her. So we're, we're very thankful to have this team with us today. And I'll get right to our presentation. Uh, just to call your attention to the fact that we are, uh, for 2018, looking at a uh, flat FTEs of 64 and a half uh, persons, which uh, is significantly less even than uh, 2007, 10 years ago. We were much larger than that, but we are a growing organization and over the coming years looking to add. But you can see that our uh, budget will be uh, proposed to increase to about 14.3 from 14.1 this year. Again, the core programs, destination branding and strategy, marketing and partnership, essentially. Destination sales, we have to have salespeople that are responsible for getting customers to sign on the dotted line. Destination services is making sure that the customer experience is good and great and, wants the, and they want to come back. Public affairs, certainly a, a very uh, growing part of our repertoire of, of functions, and that includes market research. And uh, finance and administration, as Sandy reminded me today, the backbone of the organization. Sandy did that. Isn't that what you told me today? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the 2017 supplemental budget update to show you how we have uh, invested what our uh, last uh, uh, allotment was. We received $750,000 uh, in this year's budget. Very, very fortunate to receive that. Uh, 250,000 of that was retained by the city for costs associated with X Games in 2017. We've got them again next year, as you recall. Uh, we've continued to collaborate with the Super Bowl host committee on a volunteer registration system that can be used well into the future since we have many large events, not just large events, but events in general coming to our city. We have a volunteer software that allows us to keep those volunteers engaged. Um, and Courtney, our uh, Vice President of Branding, Destination Branding and Strategies, leading the effort on the uh, upgrading and refreshing of our website. More than a refresh, it's a brand new website that we'll have launched in advance of the Super Bowl. And then for uh, the dollars we got for the Foie de Tour, it was a grand success. And of course, our tourism master plan is underway right now, being implemented. We have several committees that are active and working to fulfill those eight uh, pillars of the plan that goes until 2030. And just to give you a little visual of the before and after of what our website will look for, what I would say is that it's going to go from uh, informational to inspirational to really kind of tell more of a story because visitors want to come and have an experience and not so much interested in lists of things, but they want to know what they can do and how they can fit in. And we think this new website is going to allow us to tell our story better, capitalizing again on the need to promote experiences to visitors. And just a little reminder on X Games, all of the great 
things that came from that, 504 million homes reached. That's amazing on all the platforms of ESPN. You can look at that at your leisure, but a huge, huge success, 110,000 total people over that weekend. And now moving forward to our 2018 uh, budget change request and background, we broke it down into three different categories, essentially telling our story or bragging, making sure that we do a better job of letting the world know the great assets that we have here. Uh, engaging new customers and getting them here because even though we do really well with having uh, a large number of existing customers that come back on a regular basis, we want to increase that footprint and get new customers. And then better service and support customers means that we have to keep them coming back. So destination awareness. We, as you can see there, have a need for expanded awareness of Minneapolis as a destination. Um, not just the, the, for this big event coming up next uh, February, the Super Bowl, but for an ongoing basis. That's going to be a great, a great entree, but we really need to look at ways in which we can sustain that level of interest. Uh, again, you're very aware of these near-term opportunities, Super Bowl, Final Four, X Games, a number of NCAA events, and, and that, I just want to spend a moment on NCAA. We have really been successful working with the University of Minnesota in securing many of those championships. and. Uh, several others are, are in the hopper, but we've had a really uh, wonderful relationship with the U on that. And then, of course, looking at the return on investment and business success uh, as additional hotel capacity, and there's been growth in local taxes. And, the, uh, and because of that growth in hotels, we need to do some things to increase the demand in that new uh, group of, uh, of rooms that we've added. So Member, to me, uh, Melvin, yes, excuse me one second. I absolutely. Just want to check. Did you need? In, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Tennant. Okay. So to break down. I'm sorry. Before we break, yes. Council President Johnson. Um, you know, I know that um, we're we're kind of in a cycle right now of of sports stuff, and you know we've decided that that's really. Um, a place and you know established sports Minneapolis and that kind of thing. Do we find still though that um, that the, the medical the industry is that because that was kind of our focus for a while? What what happened with that? Well, we still do well in um, some aspects of the medical industry, biomedical and and medical devices, uh -huh. obviously because of the the corporations that we have headquartered here. And uh, Brent and some of his team members have have met with. The folks on medical at Medical Alley. In fact, Shea Mandel, their uh, their CEO, is on our board. So that was really strategic to bring him on the board to be able to do that. But there's two market segments I would just call out and thank you for giving this opportunity that are very, uh, very prominent and continue to yield results for us. One is the education segment. We do a huge number of educational events. In fact, coming in. Uh, July of 2018, next year, the uh, National Education Association, mm -hmm. I think Jeff mentioned that. So that is, um, gosh, Brent, remind me of how big that is uh, in terms of room nights. I think it's, yeah, 20,000 room nights. So, uh, and we ha we've had a lot of success there. Uh, we also have a lot of success in uh, union business. In fact, we did a, uh, a luncheon last week in Washington, D.C. with a number of union meeting planners, our board member, Bill McCarthy, uh, was with us and was the keynote speaker for this event. So that's another segment. So those are two examples of way in, ways in which we try to really get deeper mm -hmm. into the uh, market segments that, that have paid off for us. But medical is one that we continue to try to grow as well. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So the uh, destination branding and strategy component of the 2018 request, the one-time dollars of $200,000, uh, $200, uh, really, we want to be able to highlight neighborhoods. Uh, the MCC is, is a part of it. Our diversity inclusion profiles, uh, obviously, we've got a very diverse community. We need to, need to do a better job of promoting that. Uh, looking at those assets that are uniquely Minneapolis, uh, we have to really distinguish ourselves from other cities that have great assets, too. But I think this website project and the depth behind it allows us to really go deeper into um, uh, neighborhoods and really 
uh, Courtney, you're looking at a at a core of writers from various uh, parts of the of the community. About how many writers do you think you'll have ultimately when we have that progr eight to ten writers that are embedded within neighborhoods that are going to be able to provide content for us for our various platforms? Uh, of course, uh, enhanced digital marketing and public relations outreach, doing more proactive public relations. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Tennant, this is what you do. Why are you asking us for $200,000 more to do this? This is like about the easiest target for elimination of anything I've seen, and I probably personally would go after it. Mm -hmm. This is what you do, is marketing, web development. Why isn't this in your base budget? Because these are, our, our base budget has been fairly flat. As you know, our city uh, contract allows for about a 2% increase uh, a year, which is tough. And the whole cost of a new website can, can be for, d depending on, on, um, on the vendors, m north of a half a million dollars. And Courtney has been a really great steward of our resources and gotten that in the three hundred fifty dollars to $400,000 range. So there are things that we just can't fit into our current budget. And so, again, this is one time. We just can't do it. We just can't. Well, I mean, I can't imagine like a department in the city saying we want to update our website, so we're going to ask for one-time money to update our website. We'd say fit that into your base budget and prioritize the things in your communication within your base budget. Mm -hmm. We also don't have a um, slide deck, so I don't see what item, what other items you're asking for um, in addition to the base budget. I don't have one anyway. There's not one down here for me. All right, so I might have questions on the other ones too, but I, I mean, I don't know when we're looking for money for public safety and we're looking for money for um, all of these other things, I can't imagine redoing a website is gonna become a top priority for council well, members. I, I, it won't I, be for I, me. No, I, I understand, but I think in terms of our ability to do our jobs and represent the city in the way that it should be represented, um, that's why we very thoughtfully put together this request and think that it's very, it's very appropriate, so. I'm not saying it's inappropriate. I'm saying that you should make choices within your budget about what's the most important thing and then prioritize them rather than saying, here's five more things we need more money for. But a website is, um, Council Member Goodman, is pretty essential to our, our marketing efforts and it has um, not been uh, significantly updated in several years and we can really do a lot of work to demonstrate the return on investment of having a a website that accurately and um, actively represents the city. But I, I understand. I, I, mean, I understand you want it. I'm just saying mm -hmm. that's about the easiest thing that anyone could use, myself included, to pick on and say that's an extra that's not something that should be done for an additional $200,000 when we have all these other pressing issues. I understand, but I think we're, we're here to try to best represent the city and also increase the jobs and all the other aspects that um, uh, benefits that I think that we bring to the city. So um, again, I, I understand your, your concern. But now I see the whole list. So mm -hmm. there are probably easier ones I could pick on than that one, but I'll let you get through your slide deck first. Thanks. The next part is uh, city services and uh, permits for the X Games. That's for the agreement. So that remains in the city budget. Destination services, that's the the portion of the, the plan to better service existing customers and it's the expanded uh, welcome program for the 12 to 15 largest high profile groups. And it also involves uh, really highlighting uh, Nicolette Mall and using that as a way to really uh, enhance the visitor experience. The volunteer software that I think I mentioned previously that we've um, engaged with for the Super Bowl, we'll also use that for the Final Four and then ongoing uh, maintenance of that for other major events. How is this different than what happens through the downtown improvement district's um, own priority setting? I'm not sure I understand the question, Council Vice President. Well, don't they help um, uh, determine enhancements such as banners or special painting and other things like this. Um, I'm, I'm just curious how does this coordinate and why is this necessary on top of what mm -hmm. the DID does? Um, we have a great uh, partnership with them and well, there's, there's a standard banner program that we work with the downtown council on when there's major events in town. 
but I think there are some high profile groups beyond just that one initiative that we want to to highlight, one of which might be is uh, I think National Education Association. We also have coming in December of next year, the American Volleyball Coaches Association. So it's for our ability. So these are like, just to make sure I understand. So these are sort of like things, Higher unique I items to welcome large events that are coming in as part of the convention yes. recruitment yes. program. And, and also to enhance our ability to rebook in the future because all of these events that I've mentioned, National Education Association, for example, had been here a number of years ago had a great experience. We continued to work on them. Now they're coming back, and we want to be able to book them again into the future. It's a very long sales process, but it's it's really for the purpose of being able to uh, recruit these groups again, and other groups like it. Okay. So to quickly give you a, a sense of what our KPI activity has been, looking all the way to what we project for this year, we're, we're expecting to be able to achieve all of our current KPIs, even though we've had a significant increase from last year to this year and what those goals have been. So we're very uh, proud of the team, but essentially the message is that there's been a steady trending upward of our achievement of these goals. Also looking at the number of events, meetings and sporting events that we've uh, been responsible for, that number continues to grow, expecting a 731 number by the end of this year. Hotel room nights associated with the meeting and sporting events that we've hosted continues to increase as well. And so looking into the future, our business outlook opportunities include continuing to focus primarily on supporting the convention center, as Jeff mentioned, nearing maximum capacity, but that remains a priority for us. Uh, using these major events to spotlight our, um, our city, particularly the neighborhoods. There's a very robust neighborhood strategy that we don't have time to go in today, but we wanna make sure that we expose our visitors, not just to those great things that we have downtown, but really focused on getting the visitors into the neighborhoods. Hospitality jobs, I will have a little bit more to say about that and showing you some of the trends there, but also maximizing the tax revenue streams. Uh, quickly, we get our job numbers on the hospitality industry from Deed. As you can see in 2016, the annual number of leisure and hospitality jobs was just above 33,000. Although for Q1 of this year, you see that as a little under 33,000, that's a seasonal number, but we actually did get the Q2 numbers. And I, uh, Kevin, you told me it's a little over 34,000? 35,000. 35, so um, I'm, I'm sure that we'll see a sustained larger number than uh, the 33,000 we had for the year for 2016. And I think 2018 is gonna be a great year as well for a lot of reasons. We continue to see increased demand uh, that's anticipated to drive both revenues and taxes beyond these trends that are, so, that are shown here. Uh, we talked also about the increased hotel room supply and with the hotel room supply, being able to capture business that might be otherwise uh, compressed to other cities, we'll see increased tax revenues from there. Hotel room inventory, uh, we uh, have, have been tracking about a 16% uh, increase in rooms inventory. Uh, most of those rooms are not near the convention center. And uh, while we've, uh, we certainly value them, they have not really helped us to better support the convention center. And as you can see, there's been a decline in overall occupancy and many of our hotels uh, also report a decline in average daily rate, which could negatively impact tax revenues coming in the future. So at this point, I'll pause and see what additional questions there are with, with our presentation. And thank you for uh, allowing us to get through it. Um, Mr. Tennant, as the last slide, you were just talking a little bit about the uh, hotel room inventory. How many additional rooms have we brought on in the last 
three years? In the last three years, would you say, Kevin, is? Uh, approximately 1,500 or 1,700. Yeah. And I recall a, uh, a study that uh, Meet Minneapolis did uh, that anticipated that there would be a drop in occupancy and probably a drop in rate as well, just to the competitive nature of new hotels coming on. Yes, sir. And I, I think that might help explain some of some of that supply demand issue it was anticipated, but it's also going to be competitive and hopefully drawing more people in over longer term. Well, I think it was anticipated whenever there's a healthy hotel economy where there's been multiple years of, of occupancies in, in excess of 70 percent that generally gets the attention of hotel developers. I think uh, for those, obviously, our, our primary focus is the convention center, and we've always felt as though there needs to be more hotel rooms near the convention center. However, that comes with its existing hotel expansions or whatever size hotels near there. But I think we would have been well served if some of those new rooms could have been somehow situated near the convention center and um, be able to uh, uh, support those efforts there. Sure. Council Member Goodman. I'm so glad you brought this topic up. Your own president owns the piece of property directly across the street from the convention center, and he's not building a hotel there. So, I mean, if there was a huge need, someone would do it. And if there's not, the government's not going to do it. Century Plaza also was recently sold. Mm -hmm. um, the county did not pick a hotel developer either. Uh, so, I mean, this is kind of a chicken and egg situation. When you have the president of Meet Minneapolis who owns an entire block directly next to the convention center, and they're not convinced that it makes sense financially to build a hotel, that kind of sums it all up, doesn't it? The, um, I, would, I would simply say that we saw that there's been an increase in hotel rooms of uh, 1,500 anyway. The study that we did in 2013 said that if we were to, were to have brought on a, a single hotel of 1,000 rooms, that it would have taken, I think, five years for total absorption and for rates to rebound. I think what we saw anyway is that those hotels came on anyway in sort of an un, I won't say regulated, but in an uncoordinated fashion. In a capitalistic way, privately built, privately financed. Right, and and unfortunately, some of them are not uh, currently meeting their, their financial obligations, and uh, sadly, some of the actual hotel managers that were brought on with these shiny new properties are beginning to cycle out. But all I'm saying is that the rooms were going to come anyway, and if there had been some sort of coordination to help us be able to sell the convention center more um, more aggressively, since uh, it does take more hotels for us to compile a room block than it does for many of our competitors. And that is really showing up in lost business reports. And I do understand the resistance to any sort of support, but the fact of the matter is that we do lose business because it takes, in some cases, too many hotels to pull together a, an adequate room block. So that is, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Mr. Tennant, thank All you right. very thank much. Thank you, for your, sir. I'm not seeing any additional questions, but I sure appreciate your uh, uh, budget uh, presentation, and we look forward to it. Thank you Mr. so much. Quincy, thank you for your, uh, for your service, sir. Yes, sir. Good. Well, that concludes our uh, budget hearing schedule. These uh, last two were uh, what we called overtime for uh, various reasons. Uh, so we're pleased that uh, has come to an end. And our next phase is through our uh, markup process through uh, budget, as we'll be taking that up uh, after the uh, Thanksgiving holiday. So thank you very much for everybody's participation in this and for the engagement, my council members, um, uh, colleagues. And uh, we'll see what uh, next month brings. Thanks very much. We're adjourned.